All right, so this week our topic is discussing anti-heroes and sympathetic antagonists. So I want, kind of want to start with noting that there's a difference between a villain and an antagonist and a protagonist and a hero. Those are all four completely separate things. They are not the same. When they often get mistaken for being the same thing, but they aren't. Um, I mean, if you rant, that's okay. Like, have, this is a conversation. So there are obviously a lot of times, and we have people with very strong opinions here on it, that it is not done well, or there are genres and moments in which it is overdone, and there are ways that we're just like, ugh, please, could you not? So let's start with defining the four things. So a villain and an antagonist. What do you think the difference is? I see so much typing. Moral high ground. Hmm. I'm not sure that's necessarily the case, but it's an interesting thought. This is villain and antagonist, not protagonist. That's a good answer lead. Raichu also, yep. Definitely. I didn't know you were coming. Um, so right now the answers are uh, more or less, the, the answer is that I was looking for and has been answered in a couple ways here. Um, an antagonist is somebody who is opposing the protagonist, but doesn't have to be evil. A villain is just a bad guy, just an evil character. Um, the same way you have a protagonist and a hero. A protagonist is just the person whose point of view and who we're rooting for in the story, theoretically, and a hero is, you know, lawful good, or at least chaotic good most of the time, and is, you know, the knight on the shining steed sort of character. And that's a really good way of putting it, Ellie, yeah. So, antagonists are the forces working against a main character protagonists are our main character or characters. There might be multiple protagonists. And that is absolutely a perfect distinction lead. Yes, the Joker can be a protagonist, but not a hero, just like the movie Joker, which was, wow, that was a hard movie. Um, it was good, but it's a hard movie. Yeah, villain protagonist. I, I don't even know if I'd characterize him as a villain in that movie. Like, he's one in the end, but he doesn't start there, which is kind of part of the dialogue around that movie. So, when we're talking about, yeah, a villain can absolutely be horrendously evil, but, n so you can have a villain who isn't the antagonist of the story. You could have somebody who's horrendously evil, who isn't affecting the main character, or isn't the primary person the main character's coming up against. I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but you can definitely have a villain in a world that is not the main antagonist of the story. Um, author who shall not be named, I guess Voldemort is a villain in the world, but he's not the antagonist of every single story. I mean, some of the stories in there, he wasn't really the antagonist at all, and wasn't even on screen, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Like, there were some characters who were the antagonists, but Voldemort was the villain. So you can absolutely go that route. Um, so I guess the real answer would be it boils down to intent. Yeah, it, well, I mean, it sort of boils down to intent, but, I mean, that that's a little muddy. Um, Tarkin, yeah. Right, yeah, so definitely. New Hope, Tarkin, and Vader are the main antagonists. Palpatine is definitely the bigger bad, and he's the villain, but he doesn't get mentioned and is never seen on screen, really. So that is a good example of a villain versus antagonists. Now, uh, that's Admiral Tarkin. He was the guy who was Vader's like right-hand person in New Hope. So if we're talking about uh, antagonists, a sympathetic antagonist is somebody that 
the watchers, the readers, the players, like whoever's engaging in this media, they're kind of, they can understand and connect with this person and might even root for them a little bit. Um, I know I mentioned it last week briefly, but I'm going to bring him up again. Um, you had, uh, what was his name from Daredevil? Jay, what was his name? Fisk. Wilson Thank you. Fisk, uh, Wilson, yeah, Kingpin. Wilson Fisk from Daredevil, the Netflix movie series, or TV series. The way they portrayed him was as a whole human being. He wasn't a caricature. And he had a genuine, honest romance in that series with somebody he really loved and who really loved him. And he was tortured and he was kind of trying to do the right thing in the worst way possible at various points. So he's a really good example of a sympathetic antagonist and even almost sort of a sympathetic villain because he was an ends justifies the means kind of guy, but he was trying to sort of do what he thought was right. And that's a really strong example of this. So a really good sympathetic antagonist might be desperately trying to do what he thinks is right and not really able to do what is right by the standards of the story. So or they might be going too far. They might be doing the wrong thing for the right reasons, but it's still going to be the wrong thing. But you can see that they are somebody you can connect with and even feel bad for or be like, ooh, I see that point. And while I think they're wrong, they have a point. Um, I have not... I'm not familiar with Godzilla, but I am willing to uh, accept that. Yeah, so a character... I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say somebody committing genocide is extremely sympathetic, but depending on how you portray them, you could make them seem sympathetic so that you can understand their point of view. Um, I mean, I would say... Uh, Thanos is almost sort of sympathetic in the end of the Avengers series because you know why he's doing it. He's trying to, in his own messed up way, save the universe. Yeah, Magneto is sympathetic. What is your chat for this? Voice chat companion. Uh, right, so that is, that is a really common trope, is somebody who's doing something horrendous to really try and do the greater good Sometimes it is portrayed in a good way, sometimes it's portrayed in a bad way, but doing something horrible to save the world might be a really good way to show an antagonist. And even if, like, they may be wrong about whether or not they're saving the world, and if they are wrong about whether they're saving the world, that's obviously the protagonist is going to stop them. But if they're right, it really can create an interesting thing. Now, I'm not saying you have to do that inherently. Uh, and I'm not necessarily, and I'm not saying in the real world that that's a good thing or something we should aspire to personally, but it is a way that you can use an antagonist and even, you know, even a bad guy. Like a So to use D&D terms, a lawful evil character can still do good things even if they're, even if they're evil. Um, I have not played Fire Emblem, but yeah, that definitely can be a thing. And yeah, that's absolutely, um, th that is a question that could be asked. So on the flip side, you have protagonists who are not necessarily going to be characters that are the classic, does everything right, always is good character. So I would point us towards Tony Stark. I mean, I know everyone wants to go immediately to Han Solo, but Tony Stark in the early Avengers movies is kind of a... He's a jackass. You know, he's very selfish. He's very self-absorbed. He's a jerk. He's trying to do the right thing a lot of the time, but he's still a complete jerk. And he remains kind of a jerk throughout a lot of the series. So he is... You know, exactly. Like, that is a... That is a very fair uh, statement right there. So you can have a character who isn't... And I mean, Tony Stark is really likable. He was made to be charismatic. He's funny. He's very likable. 
but he's still kind of an anti-hero because he's as he versus Steve Rogers. I mean, Steve Rogers, you know, you're not the kind of guy to lay down on the wire and let the other man crawl over you. Steve Rogers is every bit the hero. And Tony Stark is very much an anti-hero. And you can see kind of the clash in their moralities. They both want to do the right thing. But Steve Rogers is more likely to, you know, pick up his shield and dun dum 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 And I know that was the Superman theme. Just live with it. Um, we're g so he's going to be more likely to be the, the guy who's going to do the right thing for the right reasons. He's the lawful good character where Tony Stark is more lawful neutral. If Again, if we're using D&D &D terms here. And he's more likely to... Like, Tony Stark did bad things for what he thought were good reasons, but were in fact just manifestations of his trauma. They weren't really good reasons. It was because he was scared. And he did bad things because he was scared, but he thought he was doing the right ones. In Civil War... Tony Stark is an antagonist in that movie through most of it, because we're from Captain America's point of view. And Tony Stark is absolutely the antagonist in that story. But he's not a villain by any stretch of the imagination, because he's still a good guy. They're on the same side, mostly when it counts. But they were working against each other really hard. So you have these kind of forces, and that's kind of the thing, is that's when I talk about an anti-hero, I think somebody like Tony Stark or, yes, Han Solo. Um, and yeah, the... the uh, in Kataru, you have a very good point about the moral ambiguity in Captain America because both sides have a good point. And absent the fact that the people spearheading the uh, Superhero Registration Act, it's actually Hydra, ignoring that point... Until we learn that, so far as we know, everybody's trying to do the right thing, and they just have very conflicting ideas of what the right thing is, though they all have the same goal of protecting the world, protecting the people in it, and saving them. If that is going to be absolutely gigantic, it's going to be really hard for me to read on screen. <laughs> well, deal with it. It's my birthday. <laughs> I guess that's fair. Yes, it is my husband's birthday today, so I'm giving him a little extra, you know, space. But, um, so yeah, if you're, now, looking at some of the poorly done sympathetic antagonists, or sympathetic villains even, and anti-heroes, um, there are a lot of characters who are put in the protagonist role. Yeah, I, I never, I didn't watch the recent Cruella movie, because frankly, Cruella de Vil is just a horrible human being, and I don't want to watch anything that makes her seem decent. Or even shows her origin stories. Um, I'd be more inclined to think... Uh, oh, uh, what's her name? I know it's basically malevolent, but it's not from Sleeping Beauty. So, like, I can justify her origin story. But I can't... Thank you, Maleficent. Thank you so much. I knew it was based on malevolent, but my brain just was not pulling that up. Yeah, Maleficent, her origin story, you can see where she became the villain. And yes, Maleficent is from Sleeping Beauty. Um, Maleficent had an interesting origin story, sort of. The, the movie wasn't amazing, I'm going to admit that right now. But at least it was an interesting origin story for why she was the way she was and why she hated the monarchy. That was absolutely a thing. You know there's a word limit, right? Uh, my husband is typing something gigantic over there. I'm not sure what, but we'll find out soon, I suspect. So, yeah, absolutely, even the Paragon can and should have flaws. I don't know if it would make them antagonistic. I'm not sure that's the right word, but it makes them human. Um, <laughs> thank you, husband. So, there we go. Um, Jay has... I haven't watched Cobra Kai, much to my husband's misery and frustration yet. Um, I did watch 
obviously I'm a Karate Kid fan, but I didn't watch Cobra Kai yet because I just haven't been in the space to watch karate movies at the moment. I've been watching supernatural fantasies right now. Um, but that's a really good example of a character that, where they sort of flip the script, where the bad guy isn't necessarily... Like, he's not the one you'd expect to be the bad guy. The good guy, the protagonist, isn't necessarily the one you expect to be the protagonist, and it shows them as human. Now, this trend towards sympathetic villains and anti-heroes is an attempt by media, I think, to kind of go back in a different direction. And what they're trying to do is humanize these characters and show that in the real world, there is a huge amount of moral gray area. Things being perfectly black and white don't really exist most of the time because there are gray areas for everything. Um, anybody who's seen the movie American History X, it does a phenomenal job of kind of talking about that gray area. Now, it's a really hard movie to watch, and I watched it once, and I'm never watching it again because while it was a really good movie, I just I don't think I want to see it again, honestly. Um, but that does a good job of kind of showing the gray areas that, like, horrible people aren't always always horrible and they might have ended up being horrible because of other external factors which doesn't exclude which doesn't excuse the fact that they are horrible people i'm not saying that it justifies the behavior or in any way makes it good cuz it doesn't but there are definitely realities that ideological purity isn't accessible so having somebody who's completely perfect in every way and isn't ever tempted by the bad side or doesn't ever do the wrong thing for the wrong reasons just because they want to things like that creating that ideological purity in fiction is sometimes an issue and right ellie it means that there can't be really any character development now that isn't to say that a, char a character should start you know you, you should have an evil character who stays evil and is completely unsympathetic and like it's not to say there aren't people in the real world. Like, you can have a villain in a story. There are people in the real world that I would consider as villains. However, I also look at them as whole people, and I imagine that they probably aren't horrible people to their family when they go home and hug their kids, or their dog thinks they're a great person. That isn't to say they aren't desperately bad people, or to in any way agree with what they say or do, but humans are humans. We are whole beings. We are good traits and bad traits. We are kind and we are selfish. We are altruistic and we are fascist sometimes. So yes, the, the morality in the story itself could be... Um, yeah, there, there is that too. I mean, Raichu, you make a very good point. Like, morality is not a static thing. It's a really complicated thing. You know, morality, what is good for one person in one culture, in one time period, in one place, might look very different to somebody else on the other side of the world whose culture is like, wow, that's wrong. Um, I agree with you entirely, Lead. I don't think that psychopath murderers with no redeeming qualities or barely any redeeming qualities or morally gray characters. No, they're evil. They're villains, usually. Um, and yeah, a morally gray character is somebody like, you know, Robin Hood is more morally gray. Like, he will steal from people and hurt people, but he also does it in order to try and help people who need it, and he's going after the people who have more than they should and are hurting people. So what they're doing is more towards the good side of things than the bad side of things, but there's a little bit of moral gray area there. Um, and I'm not... In... Yeah, the Punisher is not a morally gray area character. He is... I wouldn't call him a villain, but I would definitely say he's not entirely a good guy. Because, if we're honest, he goes around beating the crap out of people a lot in ways that aren't always good. Uh, there are a lot of characters who are held up as paragons who I'm not sure they're necessarily a good character, but okay. 
Uh, and that's a thing. But some of that can be, as Raiji pointed out, competing morality structures, people who see things differently. Though I definitely agree that the tendency of having a murderer, a, a, like a, a serial killer, who is genuinely not a good human being, portrayed as an extremely sympathetic, positive one, isn't always a good thing. It sort of makes me think of the TV show Dexter. I kind of liked a lot of it because I liked the story, but at no point did I think De Dexter was a good guy. Now, yes, he was more morally gray because De the people that Dexter was preying on were exclusively really evil people. Like, he was going after murderers the police couldn't catch. He was going after really evil folks. I have not watched The Sopranos, but I know enough to understand that. Um, but so Dexter was going after truly truly evil people, theoretically. So it made him a little more morally gray because, yes, well, he was doing really awful things. Uh, Walter White from Breaking Bad. I have not watched Breaking Bad. Uh, Bird Brain, do you have an opinion on that? Being sympathetic or not? Uh, whether or not he was morally gray. I would type that out because they can't hear you. Like, where he fits in the moral gray area. And... Raichu, uh, anti-hero doesn't require a pure evil characters to make it work. That's the thing. Like, a true anti-hero is, like I was talking about, more like Tony Stark. He's an anti-hero. Um, and, you know, he, he was not always the nice guy doing things for the right reasons. Sometimes he was a selfish bastard doing things for the wrong reasons. But he was us usually doing the right things, and he grew over the course of the series to be the guy to make the sacrifice play in the very end. So he's definitely the anti-hero Han Solo saying, hey, you didn't pay me, I'm out. But coming back because he really wanted to be, you know, he really wanted to do the right thing and felt bad about doing the wrong thing. That definitely counts as heroic behavior. I don't know where that noise came from, but I'm not thankful for it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if, I'm not sure, like, I don't think that a work that turns a a character into an extreme villain to try and create an anti-hero is a good thing. Now, there are definitely stories that explore being a villain and why these villains are this way. Like, Joker was a really good example of it. Like, it made Joker extremely sympathetic as a protagonist, but at the same time, he did horrible things. So that's kind of where it is. Like, Joker was never going to be a good guy. He, he was never going to be a good guy. Even if he had some good reasons for what he did, even if he had some good points, he was never going to be good. So exploring something from a villain's point of view and making that villain sympathetic without trying to turn them into a quote-unquote anti-hero is a fair thing. Um, I, there, there's your response about Walter White. I've never actually watched the series because my husband informed me that it's probably not something that I would enjoy. So it's just, it's not going to be my thing. So I never got into it. There are a number of TV shows and movies like that, that I respect as theater, you know, as story as whatever, but not my thing. Uh, so and when we start looking at these morally gray characters, I would agree with the criticism uh, that is leveled against a lot of anti-heroes when people turn them into characters who are horrendously evil and genuinely so, and actually bad guys, and trying to turn them into anti-heroes by making them occasionally do the right thing for the right reasons, occasionally. Greed from FMA Brotherhood. Um, I'd say he was definitely... I don't know. See, he was kind of a little bit of a morally gray character, but he was still pretty freaking evil. But I still think that he there was there were moments and there were points where he was like, uh, guys, have we gone too far? And that I, I liked the character and I like FMA Bro Brotherhood very much. Uh, I need to watch that again. It's been a while. Um... So there are... I haven't read Shadow of the Conqueror. I don't know anything about it. 
I think there are a lot of ways that you can go about creating these these gray areas without making a character truly horrible. And I think the reality is that with these sympathetic villains and anti-heroes, the stories there are becoming more just about people. Like these stories are just about human beings. They're about the people. And people aren't ever in the real world. It is an extremely rare circumstance where a human being is a hundred percent really genuinely just pure good or a hundred percent pure genuinely just straight evil like there really aren't too many human beings in the real world who are that i think there probably are a few in the world or who have been through history who could definitely be portrayed that way i mean hitler was he was an evil guy I'm not gonna, you know, sit around feeling bad for poor Hitler. But he was more than just that one thing. And I think part of this is we should resist the temptation to turn people into caricatures. Where would I fit on a moral scale? Probably neutral good, if we're talking D&D &D alignments. Um, I generally respect the rules, but sometimes we'll be like, nah, bro, but I try to be as altruistic as possible. I mean, I guess it depends on how you want to define alignments, and that's an entirely different argument that is more tabletop gaming related than writing related, but it's one that I can get into, let me tell you. I, th I definitely agree. I think most people are more altruistic than they're not. Um, I can give you an example. I have a friend of mine who has very different political beliefs than I do. I'm not going to get into, you know, what party or anything, because that's not what we're here for, and I don't really talk about that kind of stuff. But he tends to vote against things that would help poor people a lot of the time by, you know, get a damn job kind of guy. However, at one point, when he and I were talking, I told him that I didn't have enough money for food right now, and we were having real problems with that. And instead of the whole get a job type of attitude that he had with faceless strangers, he opened up his cabinets and just gave me a bunch of food and said, I, I don't need all of this, I can buy more here. So I think that example kind of puts into perspective the fact that most humans, like we're social creatures. If we, if we want to get into biology, like down to it, we're social creatures. There's a reason we live in societies. We need each other, we depend on each other, and generally speaking, when given the choice and faced with an actual human being, not just a theoretical construct or somebody through the internet, which is a completely separate discussion, we're more likely to be altruistic than not most of the time. Yeah, exactly, we do. We live in a society. Um, so you have that as a, as a thing, and I think the temptation to make villains and heroes as perfect examples of good and evil it's not a bad thing like it's been done in moral storytelling since the dawn of time it's been done through storytelling like there's there's so many stories with perfect good and perfect evil in them because that's just how it was you know that that's how it came out that's how it was in the wash and that's they somebody was trying to moralize on something and tell that story and yeah, it's so popular, partially because when we remove the gray area, it makes it easier to not have to ask questions. You just accept the good things. Um, you know, the good character is the good guy. The bad character is the bad guy. And that's just it. You don't really need to dig into, well, is the bad guy a bad guy for good reasons? Like, what is the, you know, it, it makes it less comfortable when you have to really analyze it in some ways. Um, Kataru, I have opinions on that that I can voice, but we're not going to do that here and now. Like, I'm not arguing with you, your statement. It's just that that's starting to veer into politics, but there, there's stuff that could be unpacked there. Um, but overall, I'm inclined to maybe agree. But even the people who are more likely to be like, you know, get a job and get off the street, you bum when faced with a friend who they know who's having financial issues because they're poor through no par fault of their own, um, they're more likely to be like, here, I have extra food, or let me let me get you a sandwich, let me help, I care about you, than they are to 
just be like, oh, get a job to somebody they know. Like, it, it's, it's less likely. And yeah, there's definitely um, some degrees of self-destruction or, you know, ex extremes on either end of that scale. Um, but we're kind of wandering off into mor uh, morals and philosophy here a little bit. But this is sort of part of the conversation because describing what is and isn't good, what is and isn't evil, um, as Raichu pointed out very astutely at the beginning of this, is kind of part of the villain hero push me pull you sort of situation because a villain for one person might not be a villain for another person because they might see evil differently yeah moral relativism that is a, that is exactly the term thank you carly so creating these characters these anti-heroes or sympathetic uh, villains or sympathetic antagonists and protagonists i'm not saying all of your characters need to exist in a morally gray space yeah, that, that's a really good example lead, except for the fact that, never mind, I have opinions on that too, but that's just my opinions on Star Wars and <laughs> the quality of the writing in that scene. Because, ugh. Um, so the, the... The Star Wars rant, oh boy, oh boy. Um, so, the problem I have with that scene is that Anakin went from, I'm a goody two cho Two shoes Jedi guy to the Jedi are evil in like a week on screen. Like there was no <laughs> there there was no like actual transition. Like if they had on screen showed us this slow roll and change in Anakin's point of view, not just this sudden like hundred and eighty degree screech, now I'm a bad guy sort of moment, then I would be far less cheesed off, but uh It makes me so mad. Yeah, exactly. It's not character development if you start with A and C and then suddenly you show your character it's like something completely different with nothing in between. It's not character development, it is whiplash. And that kind of gets into the plot twist conversation we had last week where it's not a plot twist if, you know. <sighs> All right. <laughs> I have not read the book, but since they were originally movies and the books were written afterwards, I would believe they'd have to do a lot of actual tap dancing in order to make it fit. Because in order to get from A to C, there's a whole lot of B that the story completely missed. Yeah, exactly. Bird Brain has it right. Like, he and I have had this conversation a lot. Um, <laughs> back on track regarding heroes and villains, I think the thing that we should all be shooting for, yeah, I think the thing we should all be shooting for is not, in fact, Anakin Skywalker. Uh, the thing we should be shooting for when we're doing all of this, when we're thinking about our characters and, like, who they are and... I have opinions on that too, Nidnid. I mean, yes, the Jedi Order were being kind of idiotic. But however, dogma sometimes... Sometimes people get entrenched in a dogma and that's just their life. That's a real thing that happens to real organizations and real human beings. Um, so we have this... We should be writing when we're writing characters. We should be creating whole people. We should be creating, like, full full-featured, fleshed-out people. Your villains, they should, depending on the story, have maybe have some kind of redeeming quality. Now, like my novel, I'm writing about angels and demons, and generally speaking, for the most part, demons are bad guys, and they're not going to have a whole lot of redeeming qualities. Angels, usually good guys, not a whole lot of bad qualities. Well, mine have bad qualities. Some of them are jerks, but you have... Um, so, that is the thing. Uh, Renard the Fox. That name sounds familiar, but I forget where it's from. Uh, Raichu, that is a thing that I've encountered. So, I tried reading uh, Hunger Games. And in the early chapters, Katniss uh, talks about how she tried to and wanted to drown her sister's cat. And I put the book down and never picked it up again because anybody who would drown a cat just for existing, I don't really care about them and I hope she died in the Hunger Games. 
Uh, I wouldn't think that about an actual human being, but characters are fine. Well, she didn't do it, but she wanted to. No, it wasn't in the movie. And it really upset me. <laughs> like, no, I know she didn't die. She she succeeded and she was the protagonist. Of course she didn't die. Uh, and it was because it's a YA show. Or YA books. Um, and so, yeah, like, be careful when you... So the way you handle an anti-hero in this circumstance... You want to make sure the audience connects with your character, like, really invests in them before you start showing how awful they are. I keep coming back to Wilson Fisk from Daredevil. Now, we go into it knowing he's a bad guy. We go in it knowing he's the antagonist. But they didn't start by just showing the bad side. I think, I, I remember the first thing they showed him do was he was being a mob boss and he killed somebody because he's a mob boss. But shortly thereafter, like, they really started getting deep into his psychology and deep into his reasons for doing things and to, to who he was and why he was that way and his motivations. And they weren't all bad. Like, he did some pretty awful things and he was a pretty bad guy, but he wasn't just straight evil. I, I don't remember. I thought that they started out with a scene of Fisk killing somebody, but I could be wrong. I haven't watched the show in a while. Uh, v for Vendetta, yeah, definitely V was very gray. Um, he did some pretty awful stuff. Like, he was he was a bad dude. Like, he was a murderer. Straight up. Like, before everything that happened, he was a murderer in prison for murder. And then he leaves and turns into this protagonist character who we're all really kind of rooting for. And... But we don't learn that he was a murderer until well after we've connected to that character. So we first connect to V in that moment where he, where he saves Evie. And yeah, he did. It was He tortured her for months just to make a point. Like, he didn't just imprison her, he tortured her just to make a point. Like, he was not necessarily a good guy, but at the same time we were rooting for him. He was a very ends justifies means kind of dude. And yet they made him likable enough and that you could connect with him enough and he was doing a thing that was right enough that sort of made it so we could be like, all right, he's not a good guy, but he is doing a good thing. And his role in the story was, you know, he was trying to bring down this horrible government. Um, I don't know much about Guy Fox. I will start there. Like, I know he tried to blow up Parliament and I know that he had reasons for blowing up Parliament. I don't remember what they were. <laughs> Um, Hugo Weaving makes everything better. But he's a, these are these are characters who are, I mean, not necessarily good. So Raichu, if you've got a character who's got some really unappealing things about them, like in the TV show Dexter, well, he's a serial killer, kind of unappealing. They made you connect with him to some degree before they really revealed the awful stuff. And, well, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, and, you know, you've got V for Vendetta. Like, you've got V, who, before you know the bad stuff about him, other than the fact that he's somebody out there past curfew who shouldn't be out there, is that he likes alliteration. And that he was protecting somebody who needed protecting. We don't learn about the really morally gray stuff about V until... A fair bit later in the story, like, it's not until he kidnaps Evie the first time that we really see, like, oh, he's kind of skeet, he's, uh, he's, he's, yeah, he's got problems. So those are kind of the things that you want to think about and look for. You want the audience to connect with your characters. And whether you're doing an anti-hero or a sympathetic villain or any flavor in between there, Making your audience able to connect to a character that you want them to connect with is extremely important because that's really going to be what drives whether or not this character becomes a favorite or whether or not they hate them or how people feel about that piece of uh, that, that piece of literature. Are you guys still arguing about Guy Fawkes? No. <laughs> Um, 
And Raichu, yeah. Some of that is going to be a taste thing. Like, there are some people who really like dark, grimdark, evil, bad guy protagonists in a story, and they really enjoy that kind of literature. Some people really get it. Like, it, it's not my thing, but there are some people for who that is their thing. I don't understand it, but hey, I'm not going to judge it because it's, you know, some people like steak, some people like chicken, some people are vegetarians. Eh. You got turned off by Rogue One? I liked Rogue One. Rogue One was a really good movie. Um, Xenatos, yeah, but he's my boy. We're not talking about Solo. Solo didn't exist. It would be cool if they made a Han Solo movie. Too bad they didn't. Jason. Well, that's the thing, Raichu, is they sort of grade the rebels to make it obvious that they weren't... Idea Again, we're getting into that ideological purity. We've moved away from that in storytelling a lot at the time. And ideological purity is almost impossible in the real world, too, because it's, you know, the world is gray. And it's really hard to obtain ideological purity in anything. So it's reflecting a change in the way the world is viewed and the way we consume media. Like in the 80s, when I was a kid, you had a good guy, you had a bad guy. The good guy and bad guy fought, the good guy won. That was... All of the cartoons, all of the movies, everything I watched, that was the way our me media was in the 80s. Because that's the trend. These days, it's the better guys fighting the worst guys, and hopefully the better guys win. Sometimes they lose. It, it, they've, they've ch they, the landscape and the trends have changed, and that's a thing that happens. Storytelling changes over time. Trends and fads change over time. There's no way around that. That's just how things are. And they will change again. The minute we get settled into the, okay, well, everything's going to be a shade of gray, it's going to go back to black and white. Yeah, exactly. Like, the bad guys were always hideous. The good guys were always attractive. Um, and that, that was absolutely a thing. So there are so many of those trends and those fads that come and go. Right now, we're in the middle of a fad where everything is gray. And some things are lighter gray than others, some things are darker gray than others, but... Mm. Which, I'm not saying you need to jump on that bandwagon, then you can't write something that good guys versus bad guys, good guys triumph, the end. You can absolutely write that kind of story. You're going to have to find the target market for that story, but you can write that story, and there are still people who will enjoy it. And it's okay. Though we've kind of moved away from that into... Yeah... Um, there are stories with uh, hideous main characters who are protagonists. Um, uh, what's his name? I'm picturing one right now. It was the guy who wrote love letters for somebody. He was too ugly, the woman wouldn't love him, but he wrote the love letters for... Uh, Cyrano de Bergerac? I think that's the, the right... Yeah, Cyrano. That was a story from, I think, the Renaissance, honestly. I think it was a play. And Cyrano is just this horrible, hideous dude. Yeah, Hunchback of Notre Dame is another one. These hideous, twisted people who are really ugly, but are really good, loving, beautiful people. Um, I don't know much about Hunchback other than the Disney version, because I never read the book. But from what I understand, the Hunchback in the book was also a really good human being. So these is there those that um that trope does exist. Okay, well in the uh, in the Disney movie he was really like badly deformed. I don't know what it, he was like in the novel. No, I totally agree and honestly when I'm writing I don't really think about moral or ideological purity. I try and write a good story with people Characters that people connect with. You know, there are going to be characters who are morally ambiguous. Uh, book two introduces a character who is very morally ambiguous. 
And at the same time, he's really likable, but he's morally questionable. Like, all the time. Um, actually, it introduced two who are morally ambiguous. There's one who's really morally ambiguous and one who's sometimes morally ambiguous. So, but I'm not doing it because I am trying to jump on a trend. I'm just, that's who those characters are. That's who they were. That's who the story shows them as. And that's just who they are going to be. And if, generally speaking, I don't try and write books to trends because as Ellie said, that just ends up with thin and pretentious and just, ugh, nobody likes it. It's not good. So don't, don't try and jump on trends. Just acknowledging that this is a thing that's going on right now. A lot of the media you're going to be consuming is going to be of that bent. Oh, there's a cat. So if you hear thumping, she's walking past the microphone and demanding my attention now. Ugh. I don't know if you can hear the purring. <laughs> Monster attack. Um, so we have the we have that to be aware of, and right now the media we consume is is largely comprised of the moral gray area stuff. So we're going to see things that are that and it's going to influence us because we are going to be influenced forever by the things that are around when we're writing. Which is one of the reasons why when I'm writing I tend to be careful about what I read because it will influence my storytelling and it will influence the kind of story I tell and it'll influence my characters and my word choice. So just that's a thing. But the media we consume will shape what and how we write. And since right now the big trend is moral ambiguity, we're probably going to be picking up some of that and our characters may end up doing that. And yes, definitely write things you find satisfying. Write what is what you want to write now. Write what makes you happy. That's fine. And I think that's a that's the best way to do things. And yeah, that was Early 2000s, yeah. I mean, Xanatos from Gargoyles was definitely a morally gray dude, and he was 90s. Um, he had a lot of moral gray areas. Like, I could wax about Gargoyles forever, but we end in a couple minutes, so I'm not gonna. <laughs> I've just started rewatching it again. Um, it's on Disney+, Plus, and I'm going back and enjoying it. Yeah, Hollywood did really start... I think that Hollywood really jumped onto that bandwagon hard in the early thousands, but I think it started kind of leaning that way towards the late 90s. Um, Mid-late 90s, it started kind of wandering that direction. Monster, what are you doing? She's being very weird. Anyway. So does anybody have any questions regarding this topic? Is there anything that we want to get it? Uh, get out. I mean, right now, the morally gray gritty thing partially is a function of the world. Like, our world is really gritty and morally gray, and so the art kind of reflects it. Um, decently written characters are not. I mean, I would hope that characters are decently written. But right now, the world is kind of... <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big fan of Grimdark. I don't like it. I know a lot of people do. It's not my thing either. Uh, it's a... <laughs> I'll explain later. Um, yeah, that's definitely a thing. Like, superhero stories and dystopias definitely tend to be more prevalent when people are upset. But I mean, art reflects the world. And yes, absolutely right, you. Like, Morally Grey can be well-written. There are good ways and bad ways to do just about everything, and I think that I'm not going to condemn any specific thing just because it exists. Um, Grimdark is 100% not my deal, but there are people who find it cathartic and who really enjoy it, so I'm not going to knock somebody else's enjoyment. Like, that's, you know. Well, for purposes of your group, explain to us what Grimdark is. I don't have a definition of it. It's a, I, I, It's one of those I know it when I see it. 
I don't know. Jay wants to Jay wants to know if any of you can define grimdark for him because he doesn't understand the term. You talking in the background is going to be difficult to pick up on Mike. Speak for me. <sighs> um, Anagram describes it as, oh, he's so brutal because the world is brutal. Mur murder, gore, and gore for no reason. I think, uh, like, Warhammer 50k is kind of grimdark, isn't it? I mean, dark is okay, edgy is okay, just extreme is... Ugh. Yep. Yeah, I, okay, so grimdark was definitely started by Warhammer 40k. Alright, I, I thought it was kind of that. Um, yeah, the... Everything is miserable. Nobody ever changes it for the better. It's just awful and sad and is always going to be awful and miserable. And dystopian, amoral, violent. Like, ultra-violence. Yeah. And yeah, I, I kind of agree with that, Katara. The, the line that separates Grimdark from other stories is the fact that there's no fixing things. It's always going to be awful, so just embrace the suck. And yeah, it, it definitely doesn't... I like stories with hope. I I like hope. I like... I mean, but I'm a happy ending junkie. So all of my stories have to have, it, if not a happy ending, at least a satisfying ending. And I'd prefer if the characters we've been rooting for this whole time don't just die constantly. Like, yeah... Birdbrain is absolutely correct. Like, I if if there's a show I want to watch and I'm iffy about, I will often ask him to look into things to find out if the ending is worth the journey. Because if everybody dies and it's just sad tragedy at the end, I don't want to watch it. Yeah. Yeah, Noble Bright has always been my jam. Um, and yes. Birdbrain absolutely does, like, filter some of my media for me. Like, you wouldn't like this. Everybody who, like, dies. Um, now, I, that isn't to say that a character dying for poignant reasons that I really loved might not be a thing that I can endure. I'm looking at you and McCaffrey and the great beyond. You killed my Master Harper Robin. <laughs> but it was a really satisfying death, and it was a death the way that he should have gone. So it was beautiful, but it was sad, and it was... Mm. Um, yeah, Fault in Our Stars, I've heard it's really tragic. I've never watched it because it would just make me sad. A meaningful death, yeah, that that can be a good thing, but I, I don't want it to be just... I don't like things that end with sad because I deal with enough sad in the real world already. I'm sad enough. I don't want to be sadder. Yeah, Joker was a really hard movie to watch. Like, that was a really hard movie to watch. It was good. I liked it. I don't know. It's sort of like American History X. It's one of those movies that I'm glad I saw it, but I don't know how many times I'll watch it again. You know, it's it's an important thing for me to see. I've read books that are like that. It's important for me to read, and I recognize the quality, but I don't know if I would want to do it again. Contrast to that, like, Watership Down. You know, you've got Hazel who dies in the end, but he dies in the end for... Like, it's it's old age, and it's beautiful, and it's sweet, and it's just the cycle of life kind of thing. Like, he's not murdered, it's not horrible, it's just the end of the story, the closing of the credits. Like, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, there are plenty of pieces where the main character dies in the end. But it's not always, like, tragic and horrible. Yeah, Squid Game, I just, I'm not interested in it. And I guess that that definitely could be a good mentality lead. I I can't really connect with it. I mean, I guess I can because I've I've lived that. But since I've lived that, I don't really want to go through it again because it was miserable the first time, and I don't want to do it again. So, <laughs> my husband is getting text messages. Yeah, no, I'm not either. I'm I'm talking. Like, there, there's a certain kind of stoic satisfaction to an ending like that. So I, I understand it, but it's just, it's not my 
thing. And yeah, Joker was definitely a statement movie. <laughs> Misery porn. No, there's a phrase I haven't heard. Yay, bees! All right, so it is seven. Um, it's about time for me to go downstairs and murder my players. I'm wearing my uh, DM t-shirt. So it is my husband's birthday, so of course he's going to have to die. That is, <laughs> that is just how it goes. Speaking of grimdark, right? <sighs> Carly wishes you happy birthday. Um, all right, so thank you all for coming. I hope you have a wonderful evening, and I hope that I will see you next week. Um, we should discuss the topic of next week in the chat. Also, happy Halloween, or All Hallows Eve, or Samhain, depending on where you live. Um, romance is up to Heather. I will poke her about it, but that's going to be up to her. And I know she's been dealing with a lot. I know you need romance, but I can't help you with romance. Like, I've been married so long I forgot. Like, I don't do the whole falling in love romance novel thing so well. I mean, I can try. No, it just made you sound like you don't do romance because you're married. No, I just, I've forgotten how to make somebody fall in love with me. I haven't had to date in like 12 years. So. Other than like taking my husband out for dinner. I'm probably just digging myself into China. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs> Oh, now that's so sweet. I mean, yeah, I fall in love with you too, like, relatively often, but it's not like, you know, we're trying to court each other, really. It's a different sort of thing. Uh, all right, so have a great night, everybody. Uh, the the wolf spider in Jay's game is trying to court him. It is by eating his face, so uh, <laughs> good luck with that. Have a good night. <laughs>